Perfect. So it looks like we are all live on Facebook now too. Uh, Laura, I don't know if you can double check that, make sure everything looks good on that end and that screen looks okay here. Perfect. All righty. Awesome. So let's see. We are at that 930 mark. I don't know if we want to wait a minute or two for more people to come in or if we're ready to go. I'm ready out here. Already doesn't. Okay, perfect then. All righty. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Nature Wonder Alive with Mr. Dustin. Um, it's great to have you all here today. Uh, first things first is uh, I'm Katie Caldwell. I'm the new education intern, and uh, Mr. Dustin here is our director of education. Uh, he's going to take you out into the scrub today. And we have our special guest scientist, uh, let's see, Haley Dole from the pa uh, Plant Ecology Lab with us today too. She'll be sharing some cool stuff about plant defenses. And also just a reminder that we do have some upcoming shows. And I know Laura went over this a little bit, uh, but if you do want to communicate with us at all today, feel free to use the chat function um, at the bottom there. Um, you will be muted for the entire presentation and your cameras will be off. If you do have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A buttons only. It's our best way to keep track of them. Um, and we are broadcasting live to Facebook now too. So um, it will be recorded and available uh, on Facebook and then on our YouTube in the next couple days. All righty, perfect, perfect. So Dustin, are you out there in the field? Hello, everyone. Awesome. Hi, Katie. Hello. We hear you great. See you great. It looks awesome. All right. Well, I am happy to take it from there. I'm trying to get into a spot where the lighting looks good on me. There we go. <laughs> it's good enough. Uh, well, welcome to Archbold Biological Station. Welcome to the Florida Scrub Habitat. It is a gorgeous day out here as it usually is when you're in the scrub uh, i'd love to see if anybody wants to put in the chat where you're where you're watching from sometimes we have people watching from up north or even from other countries and uh it, it, you can say what it's like where you are is it is it getting chilly is there snow on the ground even uh, out here in the scrub no matter what time of year it is it's usually pretty beautiful <laughs> sunshiny and nice and warm I, uh, I'm so excited to start this new series with you. We're doing this once a month, and I think we've got a schedule through all the way through April. Uh, the way it works each time is I'll, I'll be at a different spot, and for a half an hour, we'll be looking around, seeing what kind of cool stuff is around me, and then we'll also have guests on as well. So today we've got Haley from the Plant Lab. She'll be coming on twice today and talking about plants and some of the research that she's working on. So if you're not familiar with like, where we are and, you, and you're seeing this, you might be kind of confused. Like, is, it, is that snow on the ground? What is, why is it the ground white? Is it sand? Uh, so we're gonna get into all that today. What is the Florida scrub and how does it work as an ecosystem? So the first thing is, uh, where is Archbold? Where are we? Katie, if you could share your screen and pop up this amazing photo taken in outer space. If you ever wondered, what does, what does Florida look like from outer space? Uh, this is it right here. And once this pops up, what I want you to do is, and hopefully this will work on, hopefully it's big enough on your screen. But if you look at around the middle of Florida, there's a white line. It's almost like a white spine going up the middle of Florida. It's very light. If you get on Google Maps later, you can zoom right in on this and you'll be able to see it. It's really noticeable. That is called the Lake Wales Ridge. And Katie, you can pop it up so we can everybody can see it right there. That's called the Lake Wales Ridge. And it's an ancient sand island. 
If you imagine the oceans higher than they are now, which they used to be at different times in the past, the rest of Florida was mostly underwater and you would have islands, uh, big sand dune islands like the Lake Wales Ridge standing high and dry. So this, this is the biggest of these ancient sand islands. And Archbold is right on the so southern tip, right down on the bottom there. That's where I'm coming to right now. Okay, Katie, you can stop sharing that. So you can see uh, we're right in the middle. It's about an hour and a half drive to, to both coasts and about two, uh, two hours or so to get up to Disney World up in Orlando. Now, how do you know you're in this habitat? How do you know you're in the Florida scrub? Okay, so that's one thing that we're gonna get into. But, but So I want you to start thinking about that. Um, but I want you to practice your observation skills first. So Katie's gonna share her screen again, and she has this 360 degree picture of the scrub. And we're gonna just look around that a little bit so we'll have a nice clear resolution. And in the chat, type in your observations. Pretend you've never seen this habitat before. Maybe you haven't. What do you see? And if you're with a classroom, maybe the teacher can type some of the comments from the students. How would you describe this? What hops out to you? How is it different than other natural habitats you've seen before? And I'm gonna keep an eye out for the, for the chat. I'm curious to see what people notice. And when we do these shows, we have such a, a wide range of viewers. We have everything from five-year-olds, elementary school students, college students, uh, professional scientists, and, and retired scientists. Everybody notices different things. So one thing that I am noticing here is there's not many trees. It's very low, very open vegetation. There, there's um, patches of sand in there. And yeah, there's some pine trees here and there, but not many, not many. And I see lots of palmetto, tons of palmetto plants and sandy patches. And, and the other thing to think about there is how did it get like that? Spiky, looks dry, flat land. Yeah, those are all really uh, accurate descriptions. Not very tall, yeah. And this is a very well-maintained scrub. So Katie, you can stop sharing your screen. That's, that's scrub at Archbold here. Very well-maintained. We've got people making sure it's in good shape and good and healthy. And if you can think, what do you think is the number one way that we keep it open like that? What is it that the scientists do here? Nature would do it if we didn't do it, but it's safer when we do it. What is the one thing that we do, the most important thing that we do to make sure the plants don't get too high and they stay low and open like that? Now, this is something that has happened in Florida for probably million you know over a million years or millions of years but it's a little dangerous when with our houses and that kind of stuff so today we do it ourselves i'll give you a hint florida is the lightning strike capital of north america so if we're the lightning strike capital of north america <laughs> there's something that happens in our forests here and that's fire <laughs> that's a lot of fire so these plants and the animals around here they're adapted for fire. In fact, some of these plants and animals, if, if you um, don't have fire and this grows up, those plants and animals are gone. They're gone because they need it nice and low and open. Like say you're a bird that, that lives in an area like this. Um, if the trees get up tall, you can't see predators coming and they're gonna come and eat you. If you're something that lives on the ground in the sand like this, if it gets too overgrown, there's not any sand areas for to go for you to go exploring in and dig your pits in. So let's just look around a little bit and think, how do we know we're in the scrub? Well, one, we're in Florida. <laughs> so that's good. There's three questions. One, we're in Florida. Number two, we have white 
sand. And that sand actually comes from the Appalachian Mountains uh, up in Georgia, slowly eroding over time into little bits um, of, this, of this white sand we have here. And I'll show you it up close in a second. And then the other thing, number three, is do we have any scrub oaks? Yes, we do. There's four different kinds of scrub oaks. I'll just show you one here behind me. So here we've got some, some myrtle oak behind me here. And uh, well, here is another one right here, actually. And here is sand live oak right here. And these are short, they're trees technically. Hold on, let me get better lighting on this for you. There we go. <laughs> They're, they're technically these are trees, but they're they're pretty short, shrubby kind of bushy trees. If you don't have fire, they will get up pretty tall. So yes, we are in the scrub, and I do want to show you the sand because this you don't you don't have scrub without sand. So let's get low here, and I actually do have a special lens on my camera. I'm going to switch around, and this is like a little magnifying lens. Uh, a little magnifying lens. It is a macro lens. So let's switch it around. It'll look blurry for a second here, but let's come down right to the ground here. And here we go. I'm looking at the ground. There's some some dead leaves here, and then and these leaves are starting to decompose. They're starting to break down, turn return uh, their nutrients to the sand so other plants can use them. Do you see all those little bits of sand? I'm gonna set this right, there we go. Do you see all those little bits of sand? And they look like glass and they really do. And if you think about it, plants, you know, they use sunshine, they use water, they use air but they do need some nutrients in the sand to grow. So at a place like this, it can be very hard to grow because there's not hardly any, you know, there's hardly any nutrients in the sand. Pretty cool, I'm gonna switch back here. So I think that gives us a little bit of a start to, to our morning of what the scrub is. It's, it's on white sand, it's got some scrub oaks. It's only in Florida. And I think we're ready to jump into our uh, first presentation from Haley. And she's gonna tell us about some of the plants that live in the scrub. So Haley, um, feel free to start sharing your screen and say hello to everybody. Great, great. Thank you, Dustin. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Cool. So as Dustin said, I work for the plant ecology program here at Archibald Biological Station, which means that I get to spend my day researching plants. And I'm here to talk about some of the reasons why I think plants are really interesting. So plants, I just want to remind everyone, are living organisms, which means they can sense and react to their environment. So here you can see this vine is climbing up this tree towards the sunlight. And plants know when to open their flowers based on the daylight and temperature and other factors to have the most amount of pollinators visit their flowers. Plants are also at the base of the food chain, which means they have a lot of predators. Some of these are mammals, others are reptiles, but a lot of these predators are insects. And these can be very damaging to plants. But just because plants are plants and not animals doesn't mean that they're not defended. So they can't run away like a rabbit could run away from a fox, but they are very defended and they have these amazing adaptations that keep them from being completely consumed by insects. Here's a video of this little grasshopper eating one of these leaves. You can see it eats pretty quickly and that whole leaf is going to disappear pretty soon. So plants are not like animals, but that doesn't mean that they can't sense herbivores attacking them or bugs eating them. And it doesn't mean that they're not defended. So here are some of the cool ways that plants can defend themselves against being eaten. So plants can have these sticky hairs, which they can use to defend themselves. 
These sticky hairs trap insects and make it impossible for these bugs to crawl around the leaves to feed on them. So you can see these fun little hairs sticking up on this leaf here, and they're sticky like honey, so a bug would get stuck right away if it landed on this leaf. And in the scrub, we have plants that have sticky leaves, sticky stems, sticky seed pods. Some of them even have sticky flower petals like the tar flower. Some plants also have sticky sap. And this sap can gum up the mouth parts of bugs so they can't chew. Sometimes they can even glue the mouth parts of the bug shut. And so here you can see in this video that I played, this plant has a lot of sticky sap, which is called latex. And it would be like filling up your mouth with bubble gum if you were a bug trying to bite into that plant. You wouldn't be able to chew very easily. And then this picture on the right, you can see this tiny cat caterpillar is eating in a circle. And as it's doing that, you can see that there is the sticky sap bubbling up around the edges. And this caterpillar is doing that to cut the flow of the sap to this island that it's sitting on. And after it cuts through this, um, through this leaf to stop the flow of latex, then it can eat the inside where it's um, resting right now. And that's one way that it um, gets through to eat the plant. And if you know what this caterpillar is, you can write it down in the chat. It's pretty common. Some plants also have chemical weapons, which can be poisonous to the bugs that eat them or even prevent the digestion of the leaf tissue itself. And when a plant is chewed on, it can even produce more of these toxins. So here you can see this is a tomato leaf and a caterpillar is feeding on that. And tomatoes are some of the plants that have these poisonous compounds. And in the scrub, Eryngium, which is the picture on the right, as a plant that has a lot of these toxic compounds, and you almost never see insect damage on that plant. Some plants are just too tough to eat, like palmettos or yuccas. It would be like trying to bite into cardboard. And one of the cooler ways that plants defend themselves is by using smells. So plants can actually release odors that are like smoke signals and they'll attract parasitoids, which are bugs that can feed on other bugs. And so when a bug starts feeding on a plant, the plant will release these odors, these smells, and that'll draw in these parasitoids, which will actually attack the bugs that are attacking the plant. So for example, we have surfid flies in this photo on the left, which are eating the aphids, which are feeding on this dog bane. In the center, we have a stink bug, which is eating a monarch caterpillar that was feeding on this milkweed. And if you guessed monarch from the picture before, you were right, that was the caterpillar that was cutting a circle to prevent latex from flowing to the area it wanted to eat. And on the right, we have a tomato worm on a tomato plant and these white, these white um, dots on, these, on the caterpillar are actually parasitoid eggs. So those are just a few of the cool ways that plants can defend themselves against being eaten. So just to recap, plants can sense and react to their environment. They can defend themselves from being eaten and they've evolved a lot of cool ways to do that because they can't get up and run away like a rabbit could from a fox. So with that, I'll turn it back to Dustin. Thank you so much, Haley. All the talks of all the talk about plants has me excited for this one I've got in front of me. And it is covered in bees. And I don't want them to fly away. I'm gonna try to get my phone in here. Yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and oh, maybe you saw that bumblebee just flew away right there. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll put my lens on in a second. We can see this up up close, really nice. But here, I'll put it out here so you can see where I am, where I am at the moment. This is Garbaria. This beautiful purple flower around me, and it is covered in bees. Lots of honeybees and um, well, mostly bumblebees. And let's flip this around so you can see these beautiful flower heads. Oh my gosh, they're really small. Oh, there we are, gorgeous. This, this plant, I said it's called a garbaria. 
is an aster. And aster plants, they have when you from far away it'll look like a uh, look like a flower, but when you get close, their flowers are made of lots of flowers. So we can see we're up close here. We actually see tons of little flowers here. Really super super pretty. I'll switch this back. One one thing that's really cool about field stations is that not only do we have you know lists of the flowers and the, you know, the plants and things that grow here, but besides that, we have all these observations. So we're not just studying it as a habitat with a list of things. The scientists are studying it as an ecosystem, a whole system of the living things, how they interact with each other, uh, and the non-living parts out here too, like the sand and, and the climate, and weather. Um, so in 2002, one of our researchers, Mark Dara, published a, a, um, a scientific paper so the other scientists around the world could see it. And it was everything we knew about all of the bees at, at Archbold and their relationship to the flowers. And we had... Um, over a hundred, over a hundred different bees they found at Archbold during this. And for this one right here, they'd seen 17, 17 different species of bees visiting this flower. At the time, they hadn't seen any honeybees on it yet. But since then, we've actually seen honeybees. So there's at least 18 species that, that are visiting this very pretty uh, purple flower here, Garbaria. Okay, I know that uh, you're probably thinking, oh, I just wish there was more Haley because I wanna know more about what she's doing, not just the, the cool plants out here. So we're gonna go back to Haley again and give her about another five minutes to show you what she's actually working on in her internship. So you learn what we're doing with, the, with these bees out here and figuring out the ecosystem relationships. Uh, so Haley, what else are you doing here at Archbold? Yeah. So because I was interested in plant insect interactions, I decided to study them for my internship. And I was curious how fire influences insect herbivory. And to do this, I decided to study herbivory or insect feeding on Lyonia furticosa, which is an ericaceous or um, an ericaceous shrub, which is a plant that's in the blueberry family like a tree, but not as tall as a tree. This is a branch of it here. And I decided to look at how insects feed on it across a gradient of time since fire. So areas that had burned less than a year ago through areas that had burned almost eight years ago. And you can even see on this branch, hopefully you're able to see this, that there's a couple of herbivores on it right now, including this leaf beetle and this also, this other leaf beetle, the other side, which is a larval leaf beetle. Both of these are herbivores or bugs that eat plants on Leonia fruticosa. So to test my question of how does time since fire influence insect feeding and damage on Leonia fruticosa, I went out and I tagged new leaves that didn't have any herbivory using little wire paper tags and I put them around the base of the leaves. And then I went out and I surveyed through time how these leaves were being eaten. And I had 210 plants in eight areas in, those, in that range of less than a year since fire through eight years since fire. And I recorded how much of the leaves were eaten. So you can see that this one is missing some leaf area. So it was chewed on by an insect. And I found that in areas that had burned less than two years ago, herbivory was reduced. But between three years and eight years, herbivory was pretty much the same. So that means it takes almost two years or up to two years for insects to recover after fire. I also looked at the different types of damage by insects. So this is leaf chewing because it's missing part of the leaf blade. There were also leaf miners on Lyonia fruticosa, which as you can kind of see, this leaf is curled up because a leaf miner was feeding on the leaf. Um, because this one's curled up, you can't quite see it, but leaf miners feed in between the layers of the leaf. And they're the insects that make the fun little trails across the leaf 
So the next time you're out, maybe try to look at some leaves and see if you can find a leaf miner. They're pretty abundant, so you should be able to. And lastly, I had scraping damage, which is when an insect only eats through part of the leaf. So you can see that an insect scraped across the top of this leaf, but didn't actually chew all the way through it. And I found that scraping and leaf mining damage was unaffected by fire within the time range that I studied. The leaf chewing was delayed or reduced for two years post fire. And so that was what I did for my intern project. Awesome, thanks Haley. Um, I, I had planned to show you a, another flower out here that's a real pretty one, but I noticed on the scarbaria uh, this insect that I want to show you. And you might be familiar with, with um, stick bugs, walking stick bugs, where the, it's an insect, but it kind of pretends to be a stick. We have one here in the scrub called the Devil Rider walking stick. It's black and it has yellow and red stripes on it. Um, and you do have to be careful with them. The reason they have that, uh, those danger colors on them, the yellow and the red stripes on them, is because they can squirt uh, a chemical and they aim it at your eyes. And this would be like, say, a bird was going to come and chomp down on them. Um, and, and it will bur burn your eyes. So most stick bugs are trying to be camouflaged, but this one, because of it doesn't need to be, it's pretty big and pretty bold. Um, it keeps trying to walk away from me. I'm going to try to actually grab it. And I wish I had a camera person here. I just have my <laughs> the selfie stick. I'm gonna try to grab it and hope I don't get sprayed in the face. I have gotten sprayed before. If that happens, then we'll go to the question and answers and I'll be running to the bathroom. Uh, but it's in here. I'm going to try to get it so I can show you. And I'm just going to try to be nice and um, not move too fast and hope I can get it to walk onto my hand. And then you'll get to see what it looks like. Don't drop on. Oh, here we go. Beautiful. And there's two. Oh, darn it. I just okay. I dropped it try again. It's hard to do this at the same time. Okay, in here, I'm gonna try to get it. It's moving pretty fast. Come on, buddy. Okay, there we go, there we go, there we go. So there's actually a smaller one. See how big this is? And there's a smaller one on its back is the male. These two are actually mating right now. At least it looks like they are. So the big one is the female. The little one on the back is the male. And <laughs> I need to be able to show you because they're about to leave. And right behind their head is this big nozzle. Um, actually, there's two nozzles on each side behind their head, and they can spray in any direction. So it looks like she's just gonna chill right, right there. I'll see if I can let her back onto the onto the garbaria there. Go on, sweetie. Yeah, let's see if she gets off of my. She's somewhere on my back. <laughs> so uh, I guess she's just going to hang out there for a little bit while I, while we answer questions. Uh, but I, I think that's a, a good first episode. We got to see a little bit of the science happening at Archbold, see some of the plants. Cool, cool bugs. Actually, I should sit back down so she can crawl off of me. And I think Haley, uh, 